should probably pay you and say thank you. I'm Joel. Hey, dude. Joel, nice to meet you guys. You want to give them to somebody and make yourself look good? All right. But do that. I'm Joel. Nice to meet you, man. There you go, David Joel. Nice to meet you. How you doing? Joel, nice to meet you, Jameson. I'm going to skip you. Did I give you money yet? No, never. No, oh, come on now. I know I did. How you doing? Good to see you again, man. Good to see you again. I know I already gave you some, but this is different. Too bad it's like not my face on real money, because that would be awesome. <laughs> How you doing? Good to see you, man. Thank you. Easy money. You just got to come in and smile. That's a little bit more of a corporate picture, I believe, with, uh, yeah. <laughs> Did I get you, Ken, as you walked in? You're welcome. Is that the boss? Perfect. <laughs> no, I haven't talked yet. After I introduce myself, then you're more than welcome to leave. <laughs> you have to hear that part. <laughs> I wish I could provide real money, but Rob doesn't give it to me, so... There's not much I can do about that. All right. <clears throat> Am I good, Rob? All right, well, thank you for coming in today. Uh, my name's Joel Carroll. Uh, I'm the business development manager for Atlona for the education markets. Uh, this is our first year here, and I'm really excited that we're able to come and you know, help sponsor this and get to know a lot more of you guys on the Pacific Northwest area specifically. Uh, I myself am out of Atlanta, but I cover the entire country. So every once in a while, it's nice to come see how you guys live on the other side of the country. It's a little different, um, but we love it over here. So good opportunity. Today, the presentation is future-ready platforms that will maximize your AV system and benefits or investments. We're not going to be talking about budgeting, but what we are going to be talking more about is what's happening in the market and what can we do to kind of plan for the changes that we're all going through on a very regular basis. So the first thing to take a look at is what keeps you guys awake at night? So when you wake up, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Coffee, okay? So that's important. That wakes you up. And then we start looking at audio and video and what we're doing, whether it's in teaching spaces, conference spaces, what are some of the problems that you guys are running into? What are some of the future planning issues that you have to worry about today? You can read the slide if you want or come up with your own. I'm easy. Um, <laughs> ease of use, right? Like how many times do you guys get a phone call if it's not easy to use? And whose fault is it if it's not easy to use? Of course it's your fault. It's not the manufacturers. We never do anything wrong. Um, but of course it's your fault, right? And it's your fault because you're the person that answer the phone. The big thing that you guys are also looking at, moving forward, who's maintaining your AV system? You're wanting to become more self-sufficient, whether it's either doing your own installs or being able to support the system post-install. So trying to make sure that you're putting technology in place to do that is becoming one of the biggest conversations I'm having with individuals out there. A big one, and I don't think everybody's looking at this as much right now, is the shortening lifespan of your technology. How long has VGA been around? Too long. Yeah, too long, right? It's 1985 is about when it came out. We're well beyond that 20 year mark at this point. How many of you guys still have VGA in your classrooms? What happens if you pull the VGA out? Again, it goes back to what David said. It's your fault, the room now doesn't work. So we're finding now that we have to start planning for that shortening lifespan. No longer are we getting 10 years out of our classrooms, but as new products and technology are coming in, that lifespan could be two to five years for some of the devices that we have to install now. So how do we start planning around that? What are the, some things we look for that? The other big one, it has to do with shortening lifespan of technology, supporting future trends. Who knows what's coming out this fall when Apple has another announcement? Any clue? Anybody have an idea what Microsoft's doing? Google, as soon as that comes out, 
we have now a new student base that expects anything that they have in their pocket, everything they have at home is going to work also in those facilities that you guys are trying to support for them. So it creates a real challenge for us is trying to make sure what can we do as we're moving forward to ensure our systems are always going to function and operate for the current technologies. And that's one of the big things we start looking at. Now, in your words, how many people in here are part of the IT department? How many people wish they were part of the IT department? How many people wish they weren't part of the IT department? All right, so when we looked at what happened, we used to have all the AV groups or all their own individual people, and IT, as we all know, was their group. But as our technology is starting to go more into that IT realm, it gives us the opportunity to look at ways to utilize what they've already put in place. So we can use some of their infrastructure, we can use some of their mechanisms to our advantage. It's not really the other way around. We can find ways of, you guys have already done the work for us, what can we do to take advantage of that? And what are some of the processes that you've had in place in IT we can take advantage of? One of them, if we look at IT today, how is the network run? How are the computers run? Everything's going back to a centralized management application. When you log into the network, your credentials get you access to different file structures, different folders. We're not just walking around with our laptops anymore, making sure that this is where all my data is. Everything's becoming more centralized. The other big thing is they already work on a distributed architecture. Now with a distributed architecture and network, what do you think that means? You have things like Active Directory, so for logins. What about for getting just content around, whether it be data? You've already got that network architecture in place. The switches are already in place. There's already all the cabling, already all the hard work that's been done for you. So how can we start taking advantage of the interconnections of classrooms, buildings, and even campuses in many cases? The other big thing is fail-safes. You know, right now, if your classroom goes down, if you have a control system, the classroom goes down, and you're using more of a decentralized system, it's one individual room, what happens to that classroom? The classroom's down. There's nothing I can do to get up and running without repairing the component that failed in that location. Network technology has done a really good way, has had a lot of really good successes in making sure that we are going to be able to maintain and keep up and running no matter what. Now, networks, if you remember probably 15 years ago, if I was going to say, we should put everything on the network because it's awesome, what would you all have told me? Yeah, it's not reliable, right? How often did your network go down 15 years ago? But now today, we're finding our networks actually are extremely reliable. The chances of networking going down is really minimized compared to what it was 15, 20 years ago. And we can start taking advantage of some of those applications simply because of that. So starting to take a look at simplifying AV integration and what that really means. In the old way of doing design, the old way of doing installs, we would go out, we'd have a classroom, we'd have a teaching space, we would have whatever it might be. Every single room would have its own individual component, its own individual control processor, which required a few things. One, it required a lot of cost in the technology. Every room having its own control processor adds cost. Not only is it the physical cost, but there's also the labor cost. What happens when you have to send somebody to each one of those rooms to configure the room, to program the room, and update that technology? It made it very expensive, and I might be wrong, but are you guys seeing more money added to your budget, or are you finding that you're either getting the same budget or less, and I'll have to stretch it across, not like 10 rooms, but maybe 100, 120 rooms, whatever the case may be? Our budgets may be decreasing or staying the same, but the amount of things we need to do with that money is having to be spread across the entire campus at this point. So we have to find ways to simplify part of that integration. And part of the way is, yes, cost on the actual savings of equipment, but labor cost is an extremely important thing to look at when we're upgrading our system. If we follow this old way of doing technology and do a centralized control base, what happens if we have you know, an all-in-one box, it's got a control processor in it, and now I have to add in a new type of source. It doesn't have HDMI, maybe it's HDMI 7.4 or whatever the new technology is. That entire product has to be pulled out. You have to bring in a whole new product, so your entire room needs to be updated. And the cost of doing that, again, down the road, because remember, we're seeing our technology lifespan being decreased, is going to happen on a more regular basis. So we need to start planning for the future. How can we do some of those things? And that's when we start looking at different ways of utilizing new control technology over the network. One way of doing this is centralizing control onto some sort of network appliance or onto a server that might be running a network control application. Now with that device, what it's now gonna have the ability to do is take this one gateway or this one piece of software and be able to manage 
50 classrooms, 100 classrooms, 1,000 classrooms, depending on the type of technology that you're utilizing. This is first and foremost will drop costs on equipment. But think of it from an ease of management standpoint. When you guys have classrooms, you have your classroom standards, how many different classrooms do you actually have on your campus? You really look at it. Every one we kind of say might be custom depending on the school that we're working within, but they're pretty much the same thing. We've got the same types of sources, we've got the same displays, and we have the same touch panels. So instead of building one of those out every single time, we now have this sitting on a database, just like we would do with any of our other information, any of our data out there. We can copy that room configuration, say we're gonna just build another room, paste it, change IP addresses of the device, and if I told you you could be done in two minutes, that's about the amount of time it would take to add a new room that's identical to the first room. So by centralizing that architecture over the IT network, it starts to simplify some of our design integration. The other thing we start looking at when we start centralizing it is from a setup standpoint and a support standpoint. Everything's starting to go on the network. How many people want to hop in the golf cart or walk across campus just to turn on the projector? I mean, we have to do it sometimes, but if we're able to do that just by simply logging in into a web service or a web device, being able to help that faculty member be able to turn on the room or switch their sources, it decreases the amount of time it takes you to do that and allows you guys to do what you need to do, which is design the new systems and support you know, many more than just that one person that's giving a call in. So it's a different way of looking at it because we're putting this again in a centralized mechanism. So when you talk about this, we talk about centralizing control. We talk about taking, let's say, 50 classrooms and controlling 50 classrooms with one type of device, a server or appliance. What's the first thing you guys are going to be concerned about? All 50 rooms going down. Somebody, what, what's, did I hear somebody say security? Security is one of the concerns I have, but the biggest concern I always have is that. And then the next one is, is security, every time. So what happens if that box goes down? All 50 rooms go down. Okay, well, what happens if your network server goes down on campus? If your server goes down on campus, let's say it's your uh, Microsoft you know, Outlook server that you're running. If that goes down on campus, does it really go down? you hopefully have redundancy in place, well, hopefully. So in most cases, you don't have to worry about it. If the service fails, you have redundancy built in place. Again, utilizing that IT concept, utilize redundancy in your control systems when you put them on a network. Utilizing a centralized gateway, utilizing software, you're able to put that into your network closet. If by chance, one of these types of devices goes down, the backup automatically kicks in, and to the instructor in the classroom, there's absolutely no difference. They don't know that there's ever been a problem. What happens if you do, again, a decentralized concept where each room has their own control processor, and that one control processor goes down? That one control processor, that whole room goes down, and that one control processor is down. The only way you can fix it is if it literally had a critical failure is by pulling that whole thing out, putting a whole new one back in, going through, re-uploading the configuration or the programming to it, and can you do that in a matter of minutes? Yeah. <laughs> What's that? In some cases, in some cases, I would agree. Do you guys like have spares that you have sitting around that are ready to, to flip? Is that the application? Yeah. Actually, we can recall presets and everything else from the touch panel to reload. We actually timed it. It took us four and a half many minutes to change a full D DMCS 300. And, and th I've heard a lot of campuses starting to do that, which I think is a really unique concept. <coughs> I've also had a lot of campuses also, though, tell me that the difficulty is, is they aren't able to have stock left over. So a lot of times it's then calling on your service technician to come out to be able to do that, and I think that's a great concept that you have. I love when people are able to do that to you know, simplify that process. Yeah, this may look up. Actually, our student workers can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Even <laughs> better. <laughs> little trained monkeys. You know Even better. <laughs> um, but when we do this, the benefit again is by, de by centralizing this, there's a cost savings, and part of that cost savings again comes back to the number of devices that you need to put out on campus. So there's a lot of advantages of, again, putting it on a network. We do have redundancy capabilities with technology that you guys are already using in the IT type of infrastructure. 
So that's one of the things I really like of looking more to that IT realm. It gives us another way of doing control, another way of doing management, another way of doing monitoring. The other thing we have to look at from a monitoring perspective is looking at a way of getting analytics. Now with some of the analytics that we have nowadays, we want to know things such as is the room working, what has failed, get a text if there's a problem so we know that wherever we are on campus, we can log in and provide that level of support for the individual. But the other things to look at as well is from a cost perspective, how many things are we actually using in that classroom? Do you still need to utilize the document camera? Every instructor might say they want the document camera, but if you go and you run the analytics, maybe they don't need it in the history room, but the science labs is where they really need it. So you're able to start utilizing some of this technology to be able to do uh, analytics as to what needs to be put in for the next series of rooms that you're doing. In addition to that, the other benefit of utilizing cloud technology is if you have critical errors, critical failures of something that may go down, your software is going to be backed up. A lot of campuses are already doing this again with their Microsoft services and some of the other devices to make sure that if something should happen on campus, there's already going to be a backup when that server come back, comes back online, they're able to pull that information down with an exact copy. So having that cloud capability is something you're seeing more and more manufacturers start to look at, not only in our world, but just really in the IT world. How many of you guys use cloud at home? Almost every single, does anybody have an Amazon Alexa? You don't have an Amazon Alexa? You all have to get one because she argues with you all the time. It's a lot of fun. But you're finding cloud becoming part of our everyday lives, and many of us don't realize just how much cloud is becoming part of our everyday lives whether it be from AI or whatever the case may be. For me, I can know if my front door is locked or unlocked when I walk away from the house because I'm notoriously terrible at remembering to lock the front door. So I have to be able to put that in the cloud so no matter where I am, I could lock it. Same type of thing here. If you have cloud access, you'd be able to log in through the cloud and be able to support any of your rooms from any location. Even if you're on your cruise vacation, you all can log in and make sure that everything's working properly. So you're know, looking at some of these other technologies. So when we start, go ahead, question, David. Uh, if I'm not, how full, tolerant is a system like this? There's not monitoring software already out there that mm -hmm. tells you the status of everything on the network. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're always going to find uh, those rooms that don't want to show up or mm -hmm. they just don't report back or they give you the wrong thing. So what is frustrating is to have a great system that shows you status and allows you some degree of remote control, mm -hmm. but there are those rooms that just do not cooperate. So uh, uh, I figure something is not perfect with the network. Is it on a different VLAN? Mm -hmm. uh, but there's those rooms that you can never get to work or they work today and next week they just don't report status. They don't work tomorrow. So yeah. uh, are newer systems more tolerant of that? Do they work around that? With the way that I'm talking about things, it's a different approach. So we're actually not looking at a room, we're looking at a building, or we're looking at an enterprise. So what we would be doing with the software I'm talking about, you would actually connect it to your network, and it would talk to each one of your devices individually. So if I have 50 classrooms, really, we're looking at the individual devices of each one of those 50 classrooms and talking to those individual devices directly. So we're not looking at, at a room level. So where you might run into problems is maybe a switcher is having an issue and it's not communicating. You'll know the switcher might not be communicating in that room, but maybe the projector is. So it'll help you pinpoint sometimes where that problem is a little bit more readily because again, it's not a room-based system, this is more of an enterprise-based approach to AV control. So in my opinion, I think this will give you a little bit more liability of pinpointing where that problem is. My, my biggest yeah. problem is uh, uh, false positive. Oh, mm -hmm. your uh, projector is offline, or the switcher uh, doesn't work. Yeah. I know they do, sometimes it's right down the hall, and right. everything is fine, but the reporting, yes. I, I cannot always trust for certain rooms. If that uncertainty could be removed, mm -hmm. and I, I still have a network way of resetting uh, things mm -hmm. with uh, relays, uh, power cycling things, I'd be a happy guy because 
I don't have to hop into that proverbial golf uh, golf cart, cart and driver, right? exactly. And that's really kind of the goal of centralizing things, because it removes what ends up happening with the traditional way of setting up control is you have the processor that's in the room. The processor that's in the room talks to a piece of software that tells it everything. If that processor is not properly talking to the software and giving its proper data, then that software is going to potentially have bad information. If that processor can't talk to that, you have no information at all about that room, so we're only looking at that one processor sitting in that space. In this case, if you take what we're calling a processor and we look at it now, make it a network server as an example. Right now, that network server is directly talking to, like you're saying, the switcher. If it can't talk to the switcher, we know there's one of two issues. One, the switch is down, right? Or two, the network connection to that switcher, for some reason, has failed. But we know the projector's up in the room. And we can take that back from another troubleshooting step. If we put a network switch in the room, and we know that the projector is plugged into that network switch, and we know that the way your architecture was written, also, that switcher is plugged into the network switch. If we can see the projector but not the switcher, the switcher has a problem. It's not a network issue, most likely. So depending on how you build out your architecture, more information is going to be available to you to help pinpoint and troubleshoot some of those applications. So it's a good question. The question just came up. Wouldn't you have all the devices connecting to the switcher and it would come back and report the issue? Now, devices that you're going to worry about reporting on are devices that you're controlling. So uh, is the document camera working? Is the Blu-ray player available? Is the video switcher working? Is the projector working? We're not worried if somebody brings in their laptop if it's working, but we are worried did they actually utilize the laptop so you can track for that. So in a lot of cases, what you're doing is you're going more back to, I kind of call it going back to basics. We're going back to a modular approach where the switcher is not the processor and the amplifier and everything else that's in the room. And if we do follow the modular approach, that's okay. But the problem with the modular approach that I'm seeing is as our technology lifespan is shortening, we're starting to find that that switcher needs to be pulled out or updated more regularly, which means the entire classroom technology also has to be updated. So if I have my video switcher and then I have my devices plugged into that, and then I've got my touch panel, it's all connecting separately back to a network device that's doing all the maintenance, monitoring, and control. So it's a different approach. It's almost like the way we used to do it years ago. We'd have a control processor, you'd have a video switcher, you'd have your amplifier as separate devices. But modularity means it's easier to upgrade. At home, I can tell you that I don't use a technology in my TV anymore because it's too old. So to upgrade the technology in my TV, I have to buy a new Apple TV. In a couple years, I have to buy another new Apple TV or Chromebox or whatever the case it is. So when my kids come over, I want my stuff at the end of the day to just work. I don't want to think about it. I just want to know it's going to just work. So very good question. So utilizing some of the other technology since this is on a network, you're utilizing the power of the web. So at this point, utilizing web GUIs can be what you're doing configuration with, can be doing remote control capabilities, and also can be where you're getting your reporting. So again, looking at the power of what IT is currently doing for us, it gives us a lot of additional advantages utilizing the, the network that's already there. Any questions about the control side of things? Does the architecture make sense of what I'm talking about from a control perspective? Because I know for a lot of us, it's a very different departure from what we're used to. So are you talking about basically everything being on the network and like the entire building has like a decentralized matrix switcher essentially? So well, that you're using the software to just control everything through the network? So instead of a document camera, being plugged in through a switcher then to the projector, it's going through the network that then goes back to a server room that then goes back into the projector? It could be that. The question is, so what you're talking about is AV over IP. Yes. And what you're also talking about is a networked control system. So a network control system could do what you're saying, where I'm talking to the devices, and I, I'll talk about that in a minute, where I'm taking those sources and routing them. So I think them. I'm not understanding what you are getting to that how your solution would get rid of the switcher. We're not getting rid of the switcher. We are changing the type of switcher that we're using. So instead of using an all-in-one box, remember like a home theater in a box component. Mm -hmm. 
And that's what a lot of the stuff that we do, it's a home theater in a box where it's got a control processor in the box. It's got an amplifier in the box. It's got the video switching in the box. What this would be is we still are connecting to the switchers in each individual room, the video switchers, the video components that we need to bring that signal up to the projector. So you still have some sort of a switcher device. We're removing the control from being in that space and now taking the control that has been living in that room and now putting it on the network. So now your network control device that's centralized to the campus is talking to the switcher in room 101 talking to the switcher in room 102 to do the switching of those video signals, to do the power on and off of the projector. So from a control perspective, that's one of doing, yeah. Just to clarify, in that case, your, your literal signal from that switcher up to the projector is some in-house, let's say, HB, HD base T or something like that. Exactly, it could be HD base T, it could be AV over IP, it could be an HDMI cable, it's just taking the control and, de and centralizing it as opposed to putting it in each individual room. So you're doing a lot of the things that you're already used to by putting it in that location. Now, the nice thing about doing it this way is it's a step to make upgradability of that room, again, easier. Instead of having to pull out my entire switcher that's got the control and everything built into it, when that new Apple device comes out and everything has to now be HTCP 2.2, all I'm having to do is update the processor to tell it this being the processor, to tell it, I just changed the switcher. That's it. It goes, okay. Nothing else in the room's changed. The projector's the same. It now already knows how to talk to that new device. So we don't have to go through and reprogram everything else that's in that room if we're only upgrading segments. So instead of upgrading classrooms, we're upgrading portions of classrooms, portions of technology as we move forward. What you're really doing is adopting a platform. You have campuses that are Microsoft campuses. Some a very few campuses that have a platform of only using Mac devices. You have campuses that use a Cisco platform or whatever the case may be. It's the adoption of a platform that's going to carry with you. And as software grows, what also grows on that platform? Your capabilities and the advantages of what you have available. So it's not a hardware-based control. It's a different way of looking at the concept. But to your point, if you also wanted to look in, take another step farther, you could also look at providing AV over IP as another option. Now, in the reality, how many of you guys are going to drop what you're currently doing in your classrooms and take all your classrooms and do AV over IP in the classroom today? I mean, in reality, what's the, how, how many of you are probably going to do that? Would redo all of the rooms, but you could potentially look at doing it for new rooms. Correct. So the problem that you run into if you just jump into AV over IP right away is sometimes a cost. And how much does it cost to do some of those rooms? So HD base T is still a very viable solution. If you're looking at larger auditoriums and these other applications, AV over IP is something I see more schools looking to adopt. Some of the things they're starting to adopt, though, is the reason they're looking at AV over IP is to be able to provide a new and additional technology in the future. Now I'm using that network infrastructure. I'm able to pull out an encoder, put in a new type of encoder with that new video signal type, and it's going to work in my existing now video infrastructure that I built. And that's when we start looking at about building forward friendly but legacy, forward think of it, legacy friendly systems. How many people still have VCRs in their classrooms? Yeah, I stole this picture from a friend of mine um, that he had posted on Facebook, so I can't credit that it was mine. But uh, he found this in a school where it says VCRs to be connect, disconnected in 2018, still using VC, uh, VHS, it's called media services. I mean, I've even talked to schools where VCRs are so important, if they pull them out, they actually have to cut the cable or the instructor will go pull it back out of the garbage and bring it back into the classroom. So this is, again, we're trying to find ways to create change. If we pull out the VCR, what do we do? But the other thing we have to look at, our old classrooms, how many different signal types did we have? We had VGA, we had composite video, we had S-video, we had HDMI. All those signals, a lot of times, were part of that classroom structure, and it is still today. We can't just go all HDMI in some of our schools. We just can't. We can't just go all HDMI in some of our applications. But when you start looking at redesigning your classrooms and the things you're working in, have you guys thought more about USB-C? You know, what are you seeing as far as that's concerned? And that's a new technology that's coming pretty quickly, actually, to the market. I've got USB-C on my laptop that's over here. Um, I know that my children, when they have their devices they bring to school, they have USB-C on their laptop. So it's a hardwired solution. And then what about BYOD? 
mean, how many meetings do you guys go to and you hear the word BYOD brought up or I just want to transmit wirelessly? And that's a whole other conversation in and, of, in and of itself. What does wireless mean? Well, what type of device do you want to do? Who's the manufacturer you want to support? What about, you know, security? You know, kind of coming back to that. There's a lot of these questions we have to start looking at when we're trying to support some of these new devices. So I think USB-C is one of the more important things. But really, what are you putting in your lecterns? What are you putting in your classrooms? That's really when we have to start looking at, can we use existing network infrastructure? Now with BYOD, we can sometimes use the existing wireless network infrastructure in order to get those signals onto the display in the classroom. We can use the existing cabling infrastructure in some of these applications. Some of the people that I talk to, what they actually are doing, not using existing network infrastructure at all. What they're doing is they're using AV over IP in a closed system in a classroom. They're putting a network switch in the classroom. They're connecting their encoders and decoders to that network switch. And that network switch, from a video perspective, is never going to send video anywhere else but to that facility, whatever it might be. It could be a divisible room today. Tomorrow it might be a larger lecture hall with multiple displays that they're putting in. But they're putting in that technology within the classroom. Other places, what you were saying earlier, is they're putting a centralized switch that they're doing all their video matrixing across the entire building so they can take any room and send any source to anywhere. So there's different ways to look at where that network infrastructure could be an advantage when we look at AV over IP solutions. Has anybody done anything with AV over IP yet? In the classroom or other, other technologies? What are your concerns about AV over IP? What are some of the things that you guys might be worried about? The network, like bandwidth constraints or? Network people, you have to build your confidence and trust in a network before you start deploying AV over IP. Yeah, and then that, that's one of the big concerns that I hear a lot of people talk about is we're not ready yet just because of the network. And when you go and you go up to the network admin and you start talking to them, mm -hmm. hey, we're doing AV over IP, and they're like, that's great. So Netflix only takes about, you know, 100 megabits per bit stream. And no, 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 no. We're, we're doing AV over IP. Well, what does that mean? Well, we want about you know, 400 to 500 megabits to make sure that this image is crystal clear. It looks as good as it does on this display. And then when you start talking about that, the conversation changes because now we're talking about building out a network, developing a new network infrastructure, setting up our VLANs accordingly, mm -hmm. testing the network out before we take that full dive in. So there's a little more work to that. Yeah, the, I mean, you got to do your research, you know, yeah. what you have in front of you, you know, so yeah. uh, that's the big thing. Yeah. yeah, I was on that same vein, uh, related, but much more simpler, you know, I've tried to implement uh, putting some Apple TV in some places to get folks connectivity to their iOS devices. Mm -hmm. and you know, behind the scenes, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the protocol that Bonjour, bonjour protocol, you know, <laughs> can't talk to the network guys, no, we're not passing that. We're not passing Bonjour. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then they so lock it down. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just wondering on maybe you can or you're gonna get to this is, you know, what protocols, what things are gonna be happening um, trying to implement this on a campus network. Well let's talk the question really is what protocols and what things are going to be happening in order to implement this on a campus network. If you're using A V over IP, let's pull away the BYOD for Apple TV for a minute. A lot of BYOD what there are a lot of A V over IP now is utilizing existing network infrastructure and network technology that's already there that they already understand. So when you walk in and you show them an encoder, if you stop by my table, I'll show it to you. Here's an encoder, here's my decoder. For us, quite honestly, the HDMI stops. That's where the video stops is when it gets in that encoder, that decoder. Now we have to start talking to them about the word multicast, which is part of Bonjour and everything else. The multicast discussion is a very hard discussion to talk about on some of the different campuses. Some of them are going to say, absolutely not. Okay, well, we're going to use HDBase-T because this is the way it works and, and we're okay with that. Other ones are very open to creating the culture of, let's start taking a look at multicast. Unfortunately, the battle that we run into as AV manufacturers and yourselves as specifying AV technology on campuses is we have to convince IT to change with us. 
so we can use their infrastructure, so we can save our campuses money. It's not an easy battle, but once you get a test bed, and once you do that next room, every room after that is gonna get easier. So that infrastructure and those changes, they're really just utilizing network standard protocols, and that's what we're doing with our AV over IP. So do you guys uh, have a white paper that you could probably give to our network guys to? We have a white paper, and we've got a guy that if you need to have discussions <laughs> to that level, that is probably one of the best network guys I've ever met um, that I've brought into discussions like that to say this is how we need to set it up. Now, looking at it this way, if you want to do a classroom and you want to do an auditorium and you want to get started in AV over IP, a lot of times the easiest way to do that is put a network switch in the room. It's a closed network within the room. It does save you a little money with a network switch. Might cost you more in the room because of the encoders and, and decoder technology you're putting in, but it starts giving you the experience of testing out that AV over IP experience on the campus. And once you're able to do that, you can then bring the IT staff in. They don't care what you're doing because it's not leaving the network. You're leave, leaving that one closed network. And you have that discussion. This is what we're doing. How can I now take this and apply this to the network that you guys are utilizing? And it helps them understand a little bit more what's going on. Part of the fear we might have is how do we set up network switches? Well, depending on the technology you're using, all you need to do is go to said manufacturer, download the file for the network switch they recommend. You upload the file to the network switch. You plug your AV over IP devices in and they literally just start working. And so that concept of networking is difficult. Or may, many of us may not have the IT background, but a lot of the manufacturers do pull that away from you and give you the card of, we can help you do it, or we'll give you the file and do it for you. And it really simplifies some of that integration. It's, in many cases, simple plug and play. You down, if you have your product, you plug it into the switch, you upload the file, as soon as you upload the file, it starts to build a cross-connect. You open the GUI on the software with a cross-connect, and now you can route. So in some cases, I'm actually finding, and I've not, I'm, my, my background is not IT. I mean, I came from the good old analog days, and I've taught many, many people how to do SKU compensation and how to do math and all this other stuff for pixels and everything else. IT was not my background. But what I'm actually finding is, as we're moving more down that path, it's just getting that much easier. And a lot of that fear could be taken out of by simplifying some of those applications. Now, here's an example of a room. If we look at a teaching space here, notice it's very modular in many cases. So I've got my network switch. Now, on my network switch application, everything's being routed for control. Everything's being routed AV over RP through that network switch. The benefit of doing this is, let's say over here, down the road, I have a new, new encoder I need to put in. I need USB-C in this location you'd be able to pull out one component of your entire AV system, put a new component in, and everything else is still gonna be up and running. So it's again, taking the centralized approach that we have at least for what we're doing and spreading it across the network. It makes it a little bit easier for upgrades if we look at modularity in some of our applications. So that's just one kind of application that you could utilize. You can do USB over the network. That's kind of a nice option as well, because if you guys have ever done USB extension, it's probably not the most exciting thing for us to try to do. We've tested how many different USB extenders on campus till we find the one that we like, till we buy the next device that now doesn't work with that USB extender that we standardize on. So utilizing USB over the network is another thing we can do to start to simplifying some of those applications. So your audio, video, USB. Do you guys use Dante? AS67, that all utilizes network standards. All we're doing is adding on to that. And if you look at some of the products, our product will do it, we can actually take AES67 out of our encoders and dump it right into your DSP. So again, we're removing some of that back and forth of going from digital, coming out analog, then plugging into boxes, simplifying some of that architecture that's out there. Another application could be just multi-room distribution. If I need to take an individual signal and send it through the entire facility, I'd be able to easily do that with an AV over IP solution. Now this is where multicast is a benefit to us. Because I have a 450 megabit signal and I needed to go to 10 rooms, if I'm using multicast, how much bandwidth does that take on that network? 450 megabits. It's only one signal. It's going to all the, dis all the different endpoints. They're reading it. But if you look at some of the older technology and some of the unicast applications that were out there, it would be 450 megabits to one, 450 megabits to two, 450. It adds up very quickly. So we're now doing gigabits. Utilizing that multicast technology is what partly makes all of this possible. 
And again, that's conversations that we need to start having so we can make those plans in the future. You guys might not do avular IT now, but starting to kind of softly talk to the IT staff of, if we're going to start doing this, what would it require? Can we get something in? Can we test it on your network? What do you guys feel about that? Well, one thing that, that we've had success with as far as multicast is that they're already interested for doing um, mirroring. Mm -hmm. So they are probably already interested or maybe even already have multicast set up to be able to do a <coughs> lab of 30 computers at the same time mm -hmm. using multicast. That's cool. Yeah, and you're, you're finding people become a little more willing to, to try these things out. I mean, again, five years ago, if I said the word of multicast on a campus, I would almost be handcuffed and walked out if I talked to the IT staff. That was not something they were going to talk about. But because of the technology, it's available. And a lot of this technology has been driven from what we're even doing in the home space. Any questions about anything else from the network perspective, what we're going to be doing with control or AV over IP? I'm not a network expert, but make sure I understand. But when you say multicast, you're talking multicast beyond a subnet. Is that where they... When you, look beyond at the router. when you look at multicast, there's two different ways of doing streaming, really. There's unicast, which if I'm talking to you directly, you're the only one that hears me. When I need to talk to him, he's the only one that hears me. So if I'm sending you one megabit of data, I'm sending him two megabits of data or one megabit of data, that's a total of two megabits on the network. Right now, I'm multicasting to all of you. I'm talking to you in the audience. All of you can hear me individually. You're all hearing that same one megabit stream that I'm sending out to you. So it's a different protocol. It's a different way of getting data to the endpoints. Does that explain? It, it does, and I, and I had that understanding. But I, mm -hmm. I, I thought there are currently protocols using multicast, but they're not allowed to go beyond, you know, they're, they're maintained within a subnet, and they don't go beyond the There range. are protocols that use multicast that are maintained within VLANs and subnets, but utilizing different technology on the network, we have the ability of starting to span routers and switches. Right. One of those is called IGMP. And that's where the network guys get freaked And out. that's where the network guys get worried because historically multicast means I flood the network. Mm -hmm. That's not what multicast means if properly set up okay. today. If not properly set up, you're still going to flood the network. So it's just a matter of having those network discussions. Any other questions about control, about AV over IP? Want to hear a couple options that we have that we could help you out with? I paid you all, so you have to listen to me. Um, we do have a few solutions if you're not familiar um, with Atlona. Uh, Atlona is one of these companies that we do things just a little bit different. We try to disrupt the status quo, what everybody's done in the market space, and that's what we're doing when we start to look at control. Looking at that centralized control nature I'm talking about, that's Velocity. And Velocity is a product that we introduced where this is my actual gateway that can sit on a network. Now this gateway can support up to 250 devices. We're not looking at rooms, we're looking at numbers of devices. So if you have five devices per room, that's controllable. Could be a projector, uh, your video switcher, your document camera, your Blu-ray player, your touch panel counts. I can control up to 50 rooms with this one device. If you want to do more at enterprise level, you would then work with a software that would run a virtual machine you would provide that now can support up to 2,500 or 5,000 devices. So again, it's taking more of that network-centric approach of putting everything up on the network. So it's kind of an interesting concept. When you start working with this, I can build a room in about 10 minutes. And if I need to make a change to the display because the display failed, I can change the display in less than a minute. And as soon as I make the change here, it's instantaneous to that room. It doesn't affect any of the rooms, but the room I'm working on, it's instantaneous to that specific room. So it helps cut down on some of that time. It helps cut down on some of the training that you might need because of the way that the system's operating. We do support legacy devices. It's important to be able to support legacy control, IR, RS-232, and my favorite relays. And I know it may sound funny that relay's my favorite, but we have all done some really awesome stuff with relays and digital switches over the years, especially if you've been in the industry for a while. Uh, but we have the capability of also controlling many of those legacy devices that are on the market. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at some of the things that we have from that standpoint. BYOD, uh, we've got a product that we're doing a demonstration with today, and I call this software-free BYOD. This is a product I think is very interesting in the market, and the reason being, more so than anything, it's got a switcher built into it. One of the inputs is USB-C. 
So I've got a USB-C input that can work with the new Lenovo's and the Macs and the other devices that are coming out. It's a five input, two output matrix. One output's HDMI, the other output is HDBase2. From the BYOD perspective, the reason why it's software free is I can take my phone and cast directly to it. I could take my Chromecast device and cast directly to it, and I can also cast directly to it using Miracast. So if I know how to use my own personal device when I bring it into the facility, I now have the capability of sending that content wirelessly to this product directly. And so it's just, again, a different way of looking at things. I don't have to have an app. And our refresh rate is a lot faster with that technology because we don't have to go through an app and then send the information. And then lastly, from the AV over IP perspective, we do have a market that we've been, put, we put it out over a year ago now. It was two years ago this year at Infocom where we introduced our AV over IP solution to the market. Uh, one of the main things I really enjoy about our AVRP solution is we've got dual channel encoders and dual channel decoders. Dual channel encoders, I can fit two streams of content sitting in one half rack unit. So I can have a total of four pieces of streams sitting in that one rack unit. A lot of the other devices you look at, it might only have one stream it could send out. So it's like a matrix we are talking about earlier. If I'm looking at a large matrix, say a 32 by 32, but I only use 32 in, and like eight outs, I would have the ability of building simple asymmetrical matrices, having all my encoders and decoders maybe mounted in the rack throughout the facility. So I'm not going all the way back to that main location anymore. We're using that network fabric for, to be the rack. So any questions about any of the stuff we covered today? I don't want to talk about product, product, product. I really want to talk more about the content, but I want to make sure you understand what we can do to support some of that. Any concerns? Yeah. I'm just curious on your um, uh, network-based centralized uh, controller, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, are you guys trying to steer the customer to utilizing a, you know, a GUI for the control or sticking with their touch panels? and? So we on? do have touch panels for our control, so it's a good question. I have an 8-inch touch panel. I've got a 5.5-inch touch panel, and then you can also use BYOD devices such as apps, or you could use a GUI. So we give you multi ways to do it. Our touch panels are pretty cool because they're PoE powered. You plug them into the wall and they're done. And the nice thing is if I make a change to my touch panel by hitting the web GUI, in order to change the name on a button, somebody doesn't like the name and so they're not going to call it Joel's button. As soon as I type in the word Joel's button, save, it changes the touch panel instantaneously. Doesn't matter if it's sitting right next to me or if it's on the other side of campus. So changes are very easy to make. Any other questions? Now, if you guys want, we do have a training program that's available. It talks about audio and video in general, but it also talks about other things, such as the how to set up AV over IP. We've got a really good class about that. We've also got a class that talks about our network control. Um, I can definitely give you my email address, but there's a code you need to use. The important thing to write down is the code, VIP in caps, access. It actually gives you access to part of our EdTech VIP training program. The EdTech VIP program also gives you access to what education pricing is, and you can also register from some other additional information. And so please feel free to take a picture. If you want me to smile real quick, I can do that for you guys as well. Um, but if you have any questions, reach out to me. Uh, I cover the entire country, and my goal is to make sure that I get the right things in your hands, and more so than not, be here as an advocate for you and provide you the information that you need. So if there's anything you guys need in the future, I appreciate you uh, giving me a call. I definitely appreciate you guys coming in today, and I'm going to let you go at that because I already paid, uh, paid you, and that's the end of my time. So I can't keep it unless I give you more money, right? Yeah. Happy B-Day, buddy. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> I turn 21 tomorrow, so if you all want to, yeah. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it.